Don Lee is the author of multiple novels and story collections, including Lonesome Lies Before Us, 2017, The Collective, 2012, which won the Asian Pacific American Award for Literature from the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association, Rock and Ruin, 2008, which was a finalist for the Thurber Prize, Country of Origin, 2004, Four, which won an American Book Award, the Edgar Award for Best First Novel, and a Mixed Media Watch Image Award for Outstanding Fiction, and the story collection Yellow, 2001, which won the Sue Kaufman Prize for First Fiction from the American Academy of Arts and Letters and the Member's Choice Award from the Asian American Writers Workshop. Dodd has received an O. Henry Award and a Pushcart Prize, and his stories have been published in, published in one story, The Southern Review, The Kenyan Review, GQ, American Short Fiction, and many others. His book reviews and essays have appeared in Lit Hub, Electric Literature, The Stranger, The Boston Globe, Arver Review, and I'm sure a countless dozen other places. He has received fellowships from the Massachusetts Cultural Council and residencies from Yaddo and Milanen Foundation. For many years, he was the principal editor of the literary journal Plowshares. Since 2009, he has been teaching in the MFA program at Temple University and is currently the program director. He is a third generation Korean American, the son of a career state department officer. He spent the majority of his childhood in Tokyo and Seoul. He lives near Baltimore. Rob Arnold is a Chamorro poet with nearly two decades of experience in literary publishing and related positions. Currently, he is the interim executive director of Hugo House. His poems have appeared or are forthcoming in Plowshares, the Gettysburg Review, Hyphen, and Poetry Northwest, among many others, I'm sure. He has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and has re received support from the Somerville Arts Council, the Jack Straw Cultural Center, and Artists Trust. Dawn's new book, The Partition, is the subject of tonight's discussion. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Rob Arnold and Don Lee. Thank you so much, Faith, uh, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, it's great to be here with Town Hall Seattle, and thanks to my friend Rob Arnold for agreeing to MC uh, tonight. Um, also, hello to some folks in Seattle, foremost to my sister and brother-in-law, uh, Terry and Rick Edwards, who live in Wedgwood, and also my friends, uh, Peyton and Carrie Storley, who live on Capitol Hill. And also, I should say to the audience that Don and I are, are uh, long ago, for, uh, we've been friends for a long time, but also we started out as colleagues in that um, in that scrappy little magazine, Plowshares. So uh, right about the time when uh, Country of Origin, I think, was coming out, um, we were... Uh, uh, co-workers and colleagues and Don was my boss in fact so <laughs> in Boston um, yeah <laughs> yeah um but uh but also you know besides being my boss you've been a, a mentor in so many other ways especially um when um talking about race and thinking about race um and applying that thought to the work we do in these literary spaces and um so um gosh yeah I just keep thinking about the talk that you just gave and the struggle you've had with trying to um, come to terms with how you represent race on the page. Um, and it really, you know, I think it matches, you know, some of the struggles that I've had, you know, um, identifying um, uh, in my own, you know, biography, even just, you know, having the word tomorrow in my biography, I had a friend, you know, cajole me into uh, adding that in because I didn't want to be pigeonholed, quote unquote, whatever that would mean um, as an Indigenous writer. Um, and I just, uh, I, so I guess um, this is not a question I prepared in advance, but um, you know, the idea of why, so why does identifying um, oneself as Asian or having Asian characters in your books, why does that, did that feel problematic? Um, because white writers don't have a problem leading with whiteness to me. I mean, it seems like the difference is that whiteness is, um, is just the default. Um, so they don't have to say my my white character. Um, so um, do you want to talk a little bit more about that, uh, you know, and, and how it applies to uh, maybe this this collection? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the resistance was always that uh, I wanted to be known as a writer first, instead of an Asian American writer, and all of the expectations that are heaped upon you with that label. And so, you know, what is that term Asian American? It's it's such a broad umbrella 
uh, that uh, with so many different countries and cultures and languages and religions and everything else. And, uh, and so, um, you know, I resisted it for a long time because of that. And I think that it has to do when I said that, it, you know, movies, this sort of, of uh, people wanted you to write about the, the diaspora or immigration or assimilation. You know, I remember distinctly, uh, I was on a panel um, with a, uh, a news uh announcer whom I respected quite a bit, uh, but, you know, this was, the panel of uh, some writers called Crossing Borders, and uh, and all of the writers, you know, we, we talked about this beforehand and said, we don't know why this, this, this panel is called Crossing Borders, because our, our work is not about immigration, uh, but... You know, nonetheless, we were there, and um, the uh, moderator asked me, um, why do you think it is that Koreans in particular, when they come to the United States, are more successful uh, economically when they're uh, getting established? Uh, uh, um, you know, this was actually uh, when I published uh, Country of Origin, which mm -hmm. takes place in Tokyo. Right. Uh, <laughs> And so, you know, I didn't understand, like, when did I become a spokesperson for, you know, a social political uh, or social economic uh, circumstances of Korean immigrants? And so, but that's what, you know, you're saddled with uh, just because of race and ethnicity uh, and that no other, uh, you know, no white writer would be, uh, you know, uh, saddled with. Yeah, and so that that's what irked me from the beginning, and um, you know, I mean, uh, and I, I, I don't think actually I've I've been hoping that things would improve, uh, but I think that that still exists, uh, you know, because I remember when I published Diallo, uh, and uh, uh, a young man came up to me after uh, my reading at a bookstore, and he said, oh, you know. I think he was in his early 20s or something. And I said, you know, I'm Korean American and I also want to be a writer. And my question is, do I have to write about being Korean American? And I had said, no, because I'm doing that for you. And, you know, they, the idea was that this, that he would be able to move on. The next generation, generation will be, would be able to move on. And, I think there has been progress uh, to uh, some degree, um, and there are uh, Asian American writers who have um, felt like, you know, they even don't even have to have uh, Asian Americans as their main characters. Like I remember Chang Wei Lee uh, with his novel Aloft, and they had, you know, his first person narrator uh, had a six-year-old uh, white guy from Long Island. And uh, and I thought that that was so brave of him uh, and almost revolutionary for him to do. And then there have been, you know, other writers who uh, like Ed Park and Susan Choi and Charles Yu uh, and Sabrina Murray, um, who are writing books that uh, don't center on race. And oftentimes uh, they don't um, even identify the ethnicity of their uh, characters. And so... You know, there certainly has been progress, uh, but probably not enough. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, as I was talking about ethnic literature box, I think that we get trapped in there and it might not be so much by readers. It might be more by publishers and agents. Yeah, having worked in uh, publishing before, uh, moving over into the nonprofit world, I can certainly guarantee you that there, I've been in, you know, conversations where people have asked, you know, what is the market for this book? Because there's not, you know, uh, there are not enough, for example, um, indigenous book buyers or something um, to to warrant publishing this book. And um, it, it gets very crass and very racist very quickly, it turns out, mm -hmm. in publishing. Um, so let's get yeah, let's dig a little bit deeper into the book. Um, I uh, I loved um, basically every story, and one of the things that I really loved about uh, these stories is that um, 
some of the structural elements you use in them. Um, for example, uh, doubling um, as a technique. Um, so I, you know, I saw that in uh, a number of stories, often um, where you'll have sort of an idealized version of an experience, and then you'll then we'll see the flip side of that experience um, later. So I see, you know, in the opening story, we see that with twin kind of encounters between two characters. One that's sort of where they're both the characters are kind of moving upward, and then the other where they're both really like um, kind of uh, the veil has been lifted you know, in the second encounter, um, or in. Um, or really poignantly in in the story, the Sana, which is part of the that uh, three story suite, um, at the end of the the book, you have um, you know twin experiences from two different characters. Um, uh, one where uh, the character feels that um, something magical is happening, and then the other character you know is experiencing the exact opposite. So I'd love for you to talk about like that that concept of and the structure of doubling and how you know, how you work it into your stories and what it's what it's doing there for you. Yeah, I found that uh, this became um, uh, sort of a, a, a compelling structure for me is to divide the story in half. And, uh, and, you know, I've always been interested in stories that sort of range over time and where you jump in terms of place and, uh, and period. And so, you know, uh, I've always been a fan of Alice Munro, and, you know, she just kind of takes off. There's a space break, and all of a sudden you're 30 years, uh, you know, ahead. And, uh, and so uh, uh, it's not quite as radical as that for me in these stories, um, but a couple of years uh, can make a huge difference in someone's life. And I'm interested in the sort of the, the turns of fate uh, in a character and what happens uh, over a period of time. And so that's why I got, you mentioned the Sano, and that's about a character named Alan, or he's, he's dubbed Alan. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but I, uh, I, I sort of wanted to do um, something similar to the novella, the title story, Yellow, that I was just talking about in my first book. Uh, and uh, but instead, I decided to do a, a suite of, of uh, or a story cycle of three uh, stories uh, that cover him over uh, 45 years, and uh, and just thinking of you know uh, how different uh, can a, uh, a life uh, uh, become, and so you know when the first story we see him when he's he's 14. 15, uh, and then the second story, uh, he's uh, 39 and uh, has become a Hollywood B actor. Uh, and then the last story, he's, he's uh, uh, 59 and uh, he's no longer acting and he's, he actually forms a chain of boba tea shops in San Francisco. And so, uh, but is thinking about, you know, going through sort of a midlife crisis. And, uh, and if there's a difference, you know, I guess in um, yellow and the partition, it's that uh, for me, it's experience, life experience, uh, that, you know, I am 21 years older and, uh, and I think about getting older and, uh, but also look back a lot and, um, you know, various kinds of, of uh, it's nostalgia, it's regret, uh, and, uh, and memory, um, all of those things, but also just being uh, always sort of surprised uh, um, about how my life has turned out. Um, that, so I'm going to work in some of these uh, audience questions while we go, with, and, and this one is really apropos um, because it's about nostalgia. Um, an audience member asks, your works have a nostalgic undercurrent to them uh, that they adore. Um, how are these themes of nostalgia and melancholy important to your works, or, or are they? <laughs> important. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, you know, and I think in each of the stories, uh, you know, one thing I do is and I'm, I, I don't know. I was going to say that this is a traditional thing, uh, and but you know maybe not. Which is that I have a lot of backstory uh, for each character, 
Um, I always talk about, you know, in flashbacks and backstory about where they're from and how that's affected them. And so, and, you know, in this way, um, you know, I'm trying to, even though these are short stories, uh, I'm trying to compress a lifetime um, into those stories where it's like a novel. Uh, but for me, you know, memory, uh, nostalgia uh, is, you know, uh, a huge part of life. And, uh, you know, without those, you don't have an identity. That, that's Ultimately, that's what these characters look for is they're looking, you know, to figure out those eternal questions of who am I, you know, um, what's my purpose here, and uh, where do I belong? And so, uh, and they're always looking back uh, then at the, uh, at those, those memories. Yeah, and I think that it's, um, uh, there's a really beautiful moment of that, um, which is sort of a, kind of a flash forward nostalgia what is the opposite of nostalgia sort of the future nostalgia um in the move in the in the story years ahead which is also the shortest story in the book i believe but there's this yeah. really tremendous movement um into the future at the end of that story and um uh and it, it is filled with nostalgia and yet the story takes place in the past like how did you do that <laughs> <laughs> well that story you know i wrote that's the the oldest story in the collection, and uh, and it actually came about because uh, I don't know if this was around when when you were there in Boston, but uh, there was a woman woman named Tracy Slater hmm. who ran a reading series called Four Stories. Yeah, and uh, and so she would invite four writers to read their stories, but there was a, a copia, which is that they could be no longer than fifteen minutes. And she said, I will, if it runs over 15 minutes, I will pull you off the stage. And so, you know, I had no stories that were that short. And uh, so I wrote one. And, you know, that that story just kind of arose. Uh, and then I ended up revising it for, for the uh, collection. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it goes back to, uh, I mean, probably the most formative time in my life was... Uh, high school when I lived in Tokyo and uh, you know I I live in Omoti and uh, I went to the American School in Japan uh, which was a private uh, international school uh, but um, you know in that story are all the places that I used to go I mean in 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 Japan the drinking age is 20 but uh you know we started going to bars when we were 14 and uh and it was just i mean it was just an incredible place to grow up because um you you felt safe uh that you know you weren't going to like if if you were a parent you didn't worry about your kids that, that they would get into trouble uh, you know, even if they were out drinking and going out at night. Um, and so we would just kind of roam around the city on our own, uh, you know. And um, and so these are all the places that uh, I used to go and look back uh, with, with uh, fondness. And so, but the flash forward technique is, you know, something I love uh, and um, to just sort of do that, especially when it's done in snippets, uh, you know, instead of having a section that just all of a sudden jumps, you know, just doing it that, you know, in, in years later, this is what would happen. And uh, to think, all right, you know, you can, uh, um, I mean, these are things that, that the character does not know at that time, uh, but, you know, things will happen. I do the same thing too in uh, the story Call Me um, about uh, the, uh, the chef. Yeah, and I think that there's a moment like that in one of your stories in Yellow, too, a uh, surfer being held held under and mm, uh, yeah. the little flash to the future there, which is a nice moment because we then know this, the character is safe. <laughs> <for those laughs> exactly. 
Um, so uh, speaking of characters, there, you know, there's so many vivid characters in this book, and uh, and uh, some some of them who are you know vivid in, a, in an anti-heroic way, possibly um, uh, or maybe less likable way. But I, I do. What are your who are your favorite characters in this book? Some of them must have been totally delightful to to write. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think I have a real fondness with Penny mm. and Call Me, which is the um, the most recent story that I wrote, and uh, and it's really recent, uh, and it was because um, I think I actually finished the book, and then I wrote this. Um, uh, I hadn't sold it yet, but uh, I had already thought I had finished the book, and uh, but all of the stories ended in 2019 because I, uh, I didn't want to write about. COVID. And, uh, but then, you know, I, when I realized that the book would not come out until, until 2022, uh, how, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I need to address this. Uh, and, um, you know, because how could I not, and especially after the Atlanta shootings, uh, that, you know, I, I felt like, uh, you know, it, it would be um, so cowardly uh, not to uh, say something, and so, but you know, I did it in an indirect way. That uh, the with that story, call me. Um, you know, it's in the background, uh, and um, you know, relating to uh, the sort of anti-Asian attacks and assaults, and uh, and but uh, it's not uh, a direct influence on the um, or a direct actions in the book um and so uh but yeah that's that's definitely the um I, i'm most partial to her and that story came about because i've always wanted to uh write about uh cooking and about chefs and you know so all of those like david chang series uh, momofuku stuff uh mind of the chef uh Everything else, I, I you know, I watch all of those religiously, and so, uh, and um, and then I saw this um, uh, documentary on Netflix called Andre and His Olive Tree, and it was about um, a Michelin star chef in uh, um, Taiwan, and uh, and it was about uh, there was a little interview with a woman who was his uh, call me number one uh, apprentice chef. And she said that the way that she got the job was <clears throat> that she just waited at the back door and said, you know, I, wa I want to work here, chef. And he said, no, there are no jobs. And then she just kept on waiting there until finally said, okay, you know, come in. And so, uh, so that's how that came about. But there are other, you know, uh, characters like uh, confidants, uh, you know, Jay is is uh, a kind of a a, a rough guy, uh, and um, and then probably the story where uh, you're meant to dislike uh, the character is in UFOs yeah. uh, with the uh, TV reporter, uh, where she has you know, a huge amount of self-loathing, and uh, and so you know something that's interesting is uh, I always remember there's a a treatise on um, the short story called The Lonely Voice by Frank O'Connor uh, that I read long ago. And what really st stuck with me was he said that um, the short story is ideal for um, writing about submerged populations where people are on the margins. Um, whereas in the novel, you have to have uh, the main character be sympathetic. And so uh, and I thought, is that true? You know, I mean, it's certainly, I, I think that it's always interesting to me when you have a uh, um, unlikable or dislikable character uh, protagonist. And, you know, one writer who does that a lot, uh, whom I really uh, admire is Otessa Mosca. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I thought about things like, uh, Frank O'Connor, I thought, well, what about Humbert Humbert? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's, 
say in Lolita, that's that's a novel, and uh, and that's a very unsympathetic character, uh, and so you know you can make it work uh, where you have an unsympathetic character even a, in a novel, uh, but you know I think that it's it's certainly easier to do in a story. You know what's interesting about that story to me is that you know you 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 put all the sort of narrative pressure on that character to change, right? You, there's, there's tremendous narrative pressure on that character to change. And yet all she does is become more herself. And I think that that's a really amazing and bold choice. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I, uh, I've been teaching full time since uh, 2007 before I, I would teach, you know, occasionally. Uh, but, um, you know, there were, there's always a, a student who says, oh, you know, this, this uh, in a critique, workshop critique, might say about some uh, other student's story that, uh, well, this character is really kind of flat. And I want it to be, you know, uh, a more rounded character. And so I, I think those terms are from actually uh, the aspect of the novel, uh, Ian Forster, uh, where, you know, you have a flat character that's one dimensional and a round character who uh, uh, has more dimensions. And usually there is some sort of change um, uh, by the end of the story. And, uh, but, you know, I, I think that we all know that um, people are very resistant to change, uh, that they are not easily changeable. And that even through some kind of pivotal experience, they often will not change and will actually just stay the same or double down on it and uh, and get worse. And so, you know, I think that that's actually a more kind of realistic representation of what uh, uh, people are. Do you start with character when you're starting a story? Is that is that your starting point? And does the story feel complete when you have sort of a, a round or three-dimensional character? How does how does your writing process work for these stories? You know, it, it, it really differs that, um, you know, I think that, uh, so with the collection, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that first one um, uh, years later that uh, I wrote that in 2005. Uh, and so, and then a couple others, you know, in the late, 2000s. Uh, and then uh, I wrote six of the nine stories um, starting in 2018 uh, to 20. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of look back at it and with uh, uh, a lot of the stories, they actually start with my interest in people's jobs. Uh, that, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in people's passions, uh, but also their occupations. And so uh, when, and when they're passionate about their occupations. Their occupations. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so, you know, with Top it Us, I was interested in uh, letterpress printing. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, call me with cooking. Uh, with uh, Alan uh, when he's in the second story and he's in a, in a B uh, movie action film and, uh, and I really got into that I had great fun with that because and it all really took off because um, I wanted to set a story partially in Marfa, Texas where I spent uh, three summers and um, and No Country for Old Men was filmed uh, around that. And so I was reading about, uh, you know, the filming, and I found out that um, they had a problem uh, with the scene because there was supposed to be a bunch of, of corpses, uh, dead people lying in the desert after a big shootout scene. Uh, but the, the regular sort of fake blood that you use has sugar in it. And it attracted bugs, and uh, the extras were sort of like twitching around <laughs> in the sand. And so they ended up having to import blood from special blood from England that cost like $800 a gallon. 
Uh, and so, you know, immediately that started me, you know, going into having a scene in the desert and, uh, and then thinking about um, special effects makeup. Mm. Uh, and, uh, but also I got into, you know, uh, kind of action movies. I was thinking about a couple of old ones, Romeo Must Die with Jet Li mm -hmm. and, uh, and the replacement with uh, Chow Young Fat, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, but you know it's also I'm I'm a big fan of of action films like John Wick and Jason Bourne, and you know what I found out was that um, you on the internet there are databases where you could look up all of these films and find out exactly which weapons were used. And also, which you know, jujitsu, Brazilian jujitsu moves were used, <laughs> where they just like people have detailed all of this out, uh, which was great, you know, uh, uh, great resource for me. The internet delivers some of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, what was so fun about that story is reading the um, the, the the snippets from the the screenplay and having these really great cliche. Um, uh, action moments in the middle of a literary story. <laughs> it's very, uh, <laughs> so fun. Um, it, it made me think of um, uh, a quote that I saw on Twitter the other day. Um, the writer Matt Bell um, jokingly referred to a certain kind of literary fiction as, um, oh wait, I have to pull up the tweet because it's, uh, it's perfect. Um, he called it, two people watching it snow in Connecticut and slowly de deciding to divorce. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and obviously these stories are nothing like that. So, um, so well, well done for rescuing the literary short story, Dominic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I have another audience question. Um, uh, someone asks, what was the most challenging thing about writing this book and uh, how did that fuel your desire to put this story into words? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think probably the most challenging was, uh, I, you know, I, when, when I was, uh, gearing up, I had the three old stories. I wrote uh, Confidence, and then uh, I wrote the Sano, and um, and I thought, okay, this is going to be the story cycle. And then I was stuck, and I didn't know what I was going to do with this character, uh, and you know, when he's 20 years older, and so 25 years older, and so I actually ended up writing the partition. Yeah. Uh, you know, the title story first, and then I went back to LN. And so, but, uh, but yeah, I had, I had sort of a moment where I thought, mm, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, I am going to go back to him and can figure out, you know, what will happen with him. Uh, and then I think I actually had problems with the third story as well, uh, of, you know, deciding well, what am I going to do with this guy? Uh, because I, I kept on thinking, I, I want him to have gotten in, into something uh, different, and you know, and I keep on thinking, uh, kept on thinking about um, there's an ice cream shop. Uh, they have a couple of them uh, in uh, Baltimore County called the Charmery, and uh, and somebody uh, told me once that um, ice cream shops were the ideal business because the transactions were always short and people were always happy. And, so, uh, and which is true. And so, you know, I, I thought at first, well, you know, maybe I'll have him run uh, an ice cream shop. Uh, and then uh, it was just, you know, taking my daughter to a boba tea uh, place. And uh, and so um, I I and I wanted this to take place in San Francisco, and I found you know this this chain uh, these two guys started a chain called Boba Guys, and uh, and so uh, you know I read their uh, uh, a couple of articles where they had this huge problem when uh, plastic straws were banned in San Francisco. And so they had to find, you know, something, uh, some replacement that could hold up to, you know, being submerged in milk tea. 
uh, that could hold together. And, you know, they needed something like a million and a half of these straws a year. And so that kind of clicked things off. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think that uh, I always, you know, struggled with what am I going to do with this guy? Uh, you know, because um, it, it was sort of a, uh, you know, a, a longer stretch of time. Um, let's see. <clears throat> that's uh, that's related to a couple of these questions about uh, novels versus short stories that I've been seeing uh, coming across from the audience. And so um, maybe it's a good time to talk about that. So in a way, obviously, that that last um, novella, um, that suite of stories, is is very novelistic in its in its scope, um, at least the scope of time. Um, do you feel like writing four novels since your first collection? you know, informed that story and or changed your process in writing short stories? Yeah, I mean, it is very different. And it's mostly because of, uh, it's a level of confidence. Uh, it's a level of commitment. Uh, because, um, you know, you can sort of, you start a story and, I mean, I'm a, I'm a slow writer. Uh, these stories for me took, you know, between three and six months. Uh, to write, um, and whereas with a novel, I'm able to usually write a first draft of a novel, 300 pages, uh, between a year and two years, uh, and so, um, but uh, there's a real difference in, you know, the feel of it, because uh, with a story, I can sort of, it's finite, and I can see the end of it. And, uh, and I'm working toward that end. Um, whereas with a novel, um, it's a real investment of, of uh, energy and time and, uh, and um, you don't know whether it's gonna work. Um, you know, that you live in fear the entire time that it's going to fall apart. Uh, and it often does at like page 75 or 100. Uh, there are a lot of people who can write the first 75 pages of a novel and they could just stop and they realize, oh, you know, uh, I actually don't have a story here or a plot um, or uh, there's some fundamental flaw that you didn't see and you've got to toss it away. And I've actually had, you know, for my last two novels, I had that, those kinds of false starts where I spent a year uh, working on a premise for a novel and then tossed it and, uh, and then started anew. And so, you know, which is just uh, a terrifying. Uh, and so, so you don't have that kind of fear with this, with this story. Uh, and, you know, the big difference too is when you're working on a novel, you're, um, you know, you're, you're going as fast as you can. You're writing very loose uh, drafts, first drafts. Um, but with the story, it's, you know, you're, you're still, uh, you know, trying to write quickly. But, um, but then you, when you get to the revision process, uh, you know, you really slow down. I remember on one of these stories uh, late in the day, on the first story, uh, that I spent four hours on one line. And uh, and then I thought, you know, what a pleasure this is. What a luxury this is that you can actually spend four hours on one line when you could never do that with a novel. I was just thinking, welcome to poetry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, you, you're talking about having a couple failed um, novels and having lived with a novelist, the idea fills me with dread to have that happen in a, in a household that has two writers in it. And, and you are in a household now that has two writers in it. So how has, has that changed your um, experience of writing and maybe particularly of, of, um, of not writing, of having to, uh, to set something aside um, and start something new? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that uh, with my wife, um, you know, we are very good first readers for each other. And, uh, and that might actually be uh, an exception uh, that, you know, there are a lot of couples who have agreed, you know, it's better if we don't each read each other's works. Uh, to go, you, you have friends uh, and, you know, oftentimes people, uh, uh, 
have uh, writers groups um, and to share their work and that it might be better to uh, to forego that. Uh, but we are, are I mean, it, it is tough in that we read each other's um, every draft. And so, yeah, and so uh, pretty much, I mean, uh, Michael, with Lonesome Lights before, I had 17 drafts of that novel. And uh, and I don't think that she read every single one of them, but at least half. Uh, and uh, and I, I read uh, quite a few of her uh, drafts uh, as well. And so, um, but we both know that you need other readers as well, that you, you need to deplete uh, attention with each draft. And, uh, but, you know, we really rely on each other. And, and I feel fortunate to uh, have her as a, as a partner in this endeavor. Well, that sounds very. That sounds very good indeed. Um, so I want to. Um, uh, I guess we're running out of time, but I want to save room for this question, which also kind of relates to a question that I had. Um, and this is uh, another audience question. In this cultural, in this current political and sociocultural climate, do you feel more compelled to address social justice issues in your writing? And and my kind of you know spin on that was you know what is the moral obligation of a writer, um, especially a fiction writer or creative writer in these in these mm. times? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I did. I, I, I felt that strongly with this book, whereas with the last book, uh, which was you know published in 2017, uh, I was actually trying to do something subversive in that I had, uh, you know, Asian, African American, uh, Latino American characters, uh, but I never uh, said, uh, um, pointed out their ethnicity. Uh, you could tell by their last names, uh, but uh, I made it a point where, um, you know, they were just Americans. And, uh, and so that was actually my political uh, sort of statement. Um, about that, but uh, but things you know definitely since 2016 have changed, uh, and so then I do feel like, I mean, literary fiction is you're, you're never going to have a big audience for this, uh, but you know I think that uh, you know Joseph Conrad said that his aim uh, is to make people uh, hear and see and foremost to feel. And so, you know, if you have readers, um, you know, I, what fiction can do is that you enter into someone else's mind, that you enter into someone else's interiority and you gain empathy. And so, you know, I, I wanted, uh, when I do address race, I wanna do two things. Uh, one is I want to give solace to people who feel the same thing. And the other is I want to uh, maybe open up uh, uh, some eyes for people who uh, might not be from the same background. Well, you know, you, it, this is a stunning achievement, this this book of collect, uh, short stories, and uh, I loved it. Um, can you ever see that? Yeah. Um, and uh, it's just, it's alive, it's vital, um, it's of the moment, and it's also historical, so it's all of the above. Um, and yeah, I thank you so much for, for both writing it and for being here with us to talk about it. Thank you so much, Rob. These were great questions. Yeah. Rob, thank you so much for leading this conversation. You both have a really good chemistry and you, you've known each other for a long time. So I'm glad you could reconnect on our stage. And Dawn, thank you for sharing your story and your humanity with us. I can't wait to get a copy myself and to my audience at home. You'll also want a copy, I'm sure. And you can get that through our friends at Elliott Bay Book Company. And that link can be found in the chat. And look at, look at that book cover. Look at it. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Thank you all so much and have a good night. Thank you so much, Grace. And thanks again, Rob. Good thanks, night. Tom. Thanks, Tom Howe.